Hi, I'm Peter Russell, and all my life I've been fascinated by science and the discoveries it's making about the world. But the one thing that science hasn't been able to explain is the very fact that we are conscious, that we each have an inner world of experience. It's easy to explain how life evolved from simple cells into human beings than it is to explain why any of us ever has a single conscious thought. And yet the very fact that we are conscious is the one thing we cannot deny. This is the great mystery of consciousness. Why do we have this capacity for inner experience? And it's not just human beings that have it. I often hear scientists say that animals aren't conscious. But is that really so? And when I see a dog lying on the floor asleep and its legs are twitching and its nose is quivering, I imagine it's dreaming. And if it's dreaming, it's having an experience. And also, why else would we bother giving our pets anaesthetics when we operate if we didn't believe they were conscious? Why would we want to make them unconscious? The difference with human beings is that we know that we know. We are conscious that we are conscious. Now, one way of thinking about consciousness is to liken it to the light inside a film projector. At the heart of the projector is a source of white light. And the light shines through the film and takes on the colours and forms of the film. And then an image appears on the screen. Now what we're actually seeing is just shaped light. But we get so engrossed in the movie, the stories, the feelings we're having, the sadness, the horror, the excitement, that we forget it's all just a form that light has taken on. A similar process happens in the mind. All I ever actually experience are the images appearing in my consciousness. But it doesn't seem that way. When I see a tree, it looks as if I'm seeing the tree directly. But science tells me something completely different is happening. Light enters the eye, where it's absorbed by the retina and it triggers electrical impulses, which travel down nerve fibers to the brain. The brain then analyzes the data, and from that creates its own picture of the world. I then have the experience of seeing a tree. What I'm actually seeing is not the tree itself, but the image of the tree that appears in my mind. And this is true of everything I experience. Every sound, colour, sensation, taste, smell, memory, thought. They're all just images appearing in my mind. It's all forms that consciousness is taking on. But where does consciousness itself come from? This is the great mystery. It may be that one day we'll understand the brain so well that we know the exact physical processes that go on when we have the experience of seeing a tree. But even when we do, the question still remains of why is there consciousness in the first place? Why doesn't all this brain activity go on in the dark? This is what philosophers call the hard problem of consciousness. How is it that something as unconscious as the matter of the brain can ever give rise to something as immaterial as an experience? I think it's not actually a hard problem so much as an impossible problem. Impossible within the current paradigm. In some ways, we're like the medieval astronomers who were locked into the view that the Earth was the center of the universe, with the sun, moon, and stars orbiting around it. But there was a problem with this view. The planets did not move smoothly through the sky. They wandered back and forth amongst the other stars. The medieval astronomers tried to explain the peculiar movement of the planets with increasingly complex systems of orbits. But nothing seemed to work. 
When Copernicus came along and suggested the Earth might be spinning around the Sun, no one took him seriously. And when Galileo found evidence to support Copernicus, the bishops refused to look through his telescope, knowing it could not be true. It was only a hundred years later when Sir Isaac Newton did the math and proved the new view was correct, that the paradigm was finally established. Today we're on a similar position regarding consciousness. We are locked into the view that consciousness itself is somehow created by the brain. And people have tried various ways to explain this. Some think it's to do with the processing over the brain as a whole. Some think it's to do with quantum effects inside nerve cells. But try as they may, no one has succeeded in explaining how any purely material process could ever give rise to an experience in the mind. We're rather like the medieval astronomers who never questioned their basic assumption. And what is our basic assumption today? It is that matter is not conscious. That matter is totally devoid of the capacity for experience. An alternative assumption, and one that's being taken seriously by a growing number of people, is that the capacity for experience is present to some degree in everything. Awareness itself isn't something that's created by the brain. It doesn't suddenly appear as if by magic out of nowhere once a particular arrangement of the nervous system has evolved. The capacity for experience is there all along. Now this isn't actually such a new idea. You find it's a common theme in Eastern philosophy. Many Western philosophers have explored it. But it's never been taken seriously by Western science. What happens if we do take it seriously? It turns out it doesn't really change anything in science. Mathematics is still the same. The laws of physics all hold true. Chemistry, biology, everything we've discovered there is the same. What it changes is our view of ourselves and our place in the cosmos. It puts consciousness right back at the centre of things. In this view, consciousness is not limited to creatures with nervous systems. Even a simple bacterium has a faint glimmer of awareness. Nothing like the rich experience we know, nothing like a thought or a feeling, perhaps just the faintest sense of warmth or light. If numbers could be put to it, maybe a billionth of human consciousness, but not nothing at all. As life became more complex, also its experience of the world became more complex. When it developed sensory systems, it was able to take in more information from the world. And then later, as it developed nervous systems, it was able to process that information and get a better picture of the world around. So the image that appeared in consciousness got richer and more detailed. And then with human beings, evolution took another step forward. Because we not only see the world and hear the world in all its incredible detail, we can also think about our experience. We can reflect upon it. And we can also then begin to reflect upon ourselves and the fact that we are experiencing. And we notice that we are conscious. We become conscious of consciousness itself. And this is the next great step that we've made. We have made the step into self-awareness. With self-awareness came a sense of a self, of an I that is aware. But what exactly is the self, this feeling of I that we all know so well? This is the second great mystery of consciousness. We use the word I so much, you'd think we knew what we meant by it. But as soon as you try to define this thing we call I, you run into problems. Who am I? How do I define myself? Peter Russell? That's just my name. A writer? That's an activity from my past. A man? I have a male body, but I can imagine myself in a female body. I might have different perceptions, feelings and values, but the I that has them would be the same. It's that same sense of I that has been there all my life. What is this I that is always there?